morning, everybody. Greetings from yet another cold and wet Cape Town. Well, I suppose it's winter and we must expect this. I need to make one or two uh, comments before I speak this morning. And uh, they are related really to the qualities that we Rhodesians pride ourselves in having. Uh, well, amongst all these qualities are two attributes that I, I suppose are not as praiseworthy as others might be. And one of them is that we, we tend to support the underdog. And the other is that we are rather naive. <laughs> we take things as we see them. We accept people at their word. And, um, you know, in the end, it was a combination of these two things that actually lost us our country. Now, just, just bear that in mind as, as I continue. The three years following the death of King Loban Gula were not particularly good ones for this country that was now known as Rhodesia. Um, the settlers uh, had determined on building a, a world-class country and everybody had to put their backs to the wheel. And this included the Africans, who up until that time, as part of their culture, and you know, <clears throat> one understands that, uh, led a life uh, rather of, uh, of leisure. Um, Africa was good to its people, you know, there was always food in the bush and uh, plenty of game to hunt and um, life was a lot easier than it was, say for example, for the white settlers who had um, different kinds of objectives in mind, you know, they had ambitions and um, the Africans were drawn into this. In other words, uh, they were told, look, you can't just sit here all day in the sunshine uh, talking away while your women work in the fields. Uh, there's work to be done. You know, we've got a country to build and uh, yeah, in your area where you reside, your huts are scattered far and wide. Nobody can get hold of you if we need you. Um, if we have to provide medical attention or anything for you or the, the police have to come and attend to some matter, um, it, it becomes a real problem. So, come on, everybody, up on your feet. And uh, so this uh, dreaded institution came about uh, that the Africans refer to as Chibaro. Now, uh, Chibaro is just a corruption of the English word wheelbarrow. So you were expected to, to get up on your feet, and take a wheelbarrow, and uh, help build roads and bridges and, and whatever other lines of communication um, the government felt were necessary. So, um, <laughs> look, this wasn't slave labor. I mean, you could refuse, but if you refused, you became subject to what was known as hut tax. You had to pay a certain sum of money. Well, you, you know, you've got to make a contribution to the land. You can't just live in a, in a place and, uh, and you don't want to, you don't want to pay anything toward it, either in your labor or in your, your resources that you have. So um, if, if you couldn't pay the hut tax, well, you just had to start pushing a wheelbarrow, which was all good and well. And you know that there were, there were quite large sections of the population at that time who could afford the, the, the hut tax. I think up in the Gokwe area, Gokwe, Gwai, somewhere around there, those people didn't uh, do chi uh, Chibaro. You know, the government provided the, the labor there. Um, uh, they could afford to pay because they had a, a tobacco industry which actually predated the arrival of the Europeans there. And from this, you know, it, it was an easy thing for them to, to pay this, this amount that the government had levied. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a bit of a vexing thing uh, for the black man. Uh, he felt this was a little bit of an intrusion into his uh, freedom. Uh, but that just paled into insignificance compared to the natural disasters that took place at that time. There was a plague of locusts. It devoured every green thing that uh, <clears throat> that was alive. I, I haven't seen anything like that, but it, it was the sort of thing that, that was common up until a few years ago yeah, in the southern part of Africa, and I think probably to the north of Africa too. Um, I, I remember an old man once telling me when uh, locusts came to his farm and the thing that I remember was that he said how all his fowls, the chickens, 
were just lying around almost with their feet in the air from having gorged themselves on these insects. <laughs> and that is something that I kind of remembered about a plague of locusts. So, um, yeah, uh, the fowls managed all right. Um, and then there was a drought. There was a terrible drought that went on for quite a while in Rhodesia at that time. Um, and then came the worst of all, I think, and that was the Rinderpest. This was a plague that uh, came down from North Africa, affecting domestic animals and uh, even um, wild uh, game uh, was uh, depleted by this plague. A terrible time, brought devastation in its wake, brought much hardship. People lost uh, their herds. Uh, the only thing that people knew to do in those days to try and prevent it was just to, to slaughter animals in the path of the uh, this plague, you know, and hope that it would be stopped somehow. So everybody had a really, really tough time, and it must have seemed to folk at that point as though the anger of God was being poured out upon the fair land of Rhodesia. And I say that quite deliberately, really, um, because we must not forget that religion played a very significant part in all the early history um, that took place in, the, in that part of the world. Now, I started off, oh, whenever it was, last year or maybe even the year prior to that, when I started talking about early Rhodesian history, and I excused myself ahead of time by saying I'm, I'm no uh, historian, uh, and I'm not. And, uh, and in the same vein, I, I have to say to you this morning that I am no theologian. So uh, bear that in mind. And um, I also am going to generalize a lot and reduce things to their very, very basic levels, just so that we can understand it a little easier that way. Well, there were three main religious streams of thought uh, yeah, in Southern Africa. That would be in South Africa and in Rhodesia at that time. And of course the easiest of these to understand would be the, the black man's religion. Now there was nothing really complicated about that. <clears throat> to, to the African there was no sort of grand personal plan on the part of the Creator for his life. It was very simple. If you wanted to enjoy a life of uh, prosperity in in their eyes, in their standard, uh, a life of happiness, a life of contentment. Uh, in this world and in the next, it was very simple. You just you just honoured your ancestors, and you observed the customs that had been handed down to you. It wasn't much more complicated than that. So you would go about your daily work um, unhampered by questions of morality that that didn't really affect um, your standing with your your ancestors they weren't interested so much in that but what you would do is you would uh, you would have celebrations in honor of them and um, and in this way you made sure that they knew that they were not forgotten now they in turn if you offended them, could have um, you know tremendous repercussions here in the natural world. Things would go wrong, and you would know that they don't go wrong f without a good reason. They went wrong because the ancestors are offended, and you'd need to find out what it was that was bothering them. <clears throat> but for the future life, you you could ensure that for yourself and your happiness there by having many children. This was an important part of African culture in those times because your spirit would then have a place to live. It would live amongst them. Um, so, you know, that was it. Now, for them, looking at what was happening in Rhodesia, well, clearly the ancestors were troubled. We've got plagues, we've got pestilence, we've got all kinds of things. We've got interference. Um, and what has brought this about? Why did we not have this in the past? And why have we got it now? Well, you know, the answer was as plain as the nose on your face. We never had Europeans before. 
Now we got them. We never had problems like this before. Now we have them. So there's the connection. But, you know, coming to that conclusion was one thing, but doing something about it was quite another. This sort of thing needed uh, confirmation. No matter what you thought, there had to be confirmation from the spirit world that, yeah, this is indeed the problem. And this is what you ought to do about it. And the one who would give guidance and direction on that matter was known as the Malimo. And he lived in the Matopas Hills in a cave. An invincible individual, almost, if you like, half God and half man, who cannot be killed, he would know. And so the nation waited for the Malimo to say what should be done about these disasters, what had to be done. <clears throat> but while he remained silent, Uncle Paul down there in South Africa uh, had problems of his own. His uh, nation, the Boers, were being overrun by what they called Eightlanders. These were foreigners who came to work on the mines. And they were absolutely necessary. I mean, the Boer, uh, with due respect, of course, was quite happy on his farm and getting on with his work. It was it's what he understood and it was what he was good at. But uh, he didn't take too kindly to the notion of going down underground into a mine and, and working there and doing that kind of thing. The Eightlanders were there for that. And, of course, the Eightlanders needed... Uh, management and this was provided largely by by british and american engineers and uh, and so the gold mines in south africa flourished at that time oh they brought in so much money and of course kruger taxed them he got you know his government got their share of it and uh, so the place was developed and it was humming <clears throat> but now i said earlier on that there were religious influences and certainly there were you know very often our behavior is governed by the things that we believe and likewise by the things that we don't believe sometimes more so than than facts or evidence around us we act on what we believe to be the truth and in the, the protestant world there is a great gap. There is a divide. And uh, you might say, well, sure, yeah, I know, I know about that. You've got the charismatics on the one hand, and you, you've got the conservative Christians on the other. <clears throat> it's not that kind of a gap, and that, that is a, a small gap compared to the one that I will describe to you. The, the gap in Christendom is between the evangelicals and the reformists. Um, and essentially, it, it comes down to this. The evangelical says that man uh, decides his own destiny, his own future, by the choices he makes. And the reformer says, no ways. <clears throat> man is in no condition to decide anything spiritual. God will decide these things. And so amongst the reformers, you have this idea that there is an elect and you'll find it amongst the evangelicals as well, but they place less stress on it. But there is this elect of God, which is a certain uh, number of people whom God favors above all others. And to Kruger and to his people, they were the elect. In old times, in Old Testament times, it was the Jews. But the Jews had crucified the Messiah. So now God's pleasure and his choice fell upon the Boer nation. And you say, well, that, that's a heck of a thing. I mean, <clears throat> why would they think something like that? That they were special, chosen above all other races, uh, above the blacks, above even the other whites, the British, the Americans, or, or people wherever they might come from to work on the mines. They were regarded as lesser beings because they were not part of God's modern chosen race. How could they possibly think a thing like that? On what grounds? And if you were to ask Kruger, 
Why do your people feel that they are especially chosen by God? He would say, well, look at our history. Look at the things that we have done. We've gone into battle against vastly superior numbers of blacks. We've defeated them every time. And uh, it's a miracle. Every battle for us was a miracle. And that proves that God is on our side. We have gone, we have taken up arms against the British Empire, the greatest empire on the earth. And we have defeated them at Majuba. And God gave us a miracle. It's, it's evidence. How can you possibly doubt the fact that God favors us? So, yeah. <clears throat> and um, now, yeah, he has a situation where all these people who are not part of the elect are streaming into the country. And it looks like before much longer, they're going to actually take the land over. In fact, they already outnumbered the Boers, you know, to a great extent. So all sorts of rather irritating measures were employed to discourage too many of them coming and settling here. And uh, one of the things was that uh, everything had to, any dealings with the Boer government had to be conducted in Dutch. And he even brought out um, people from Holland and filled the civil service with them. So it was very difficult. I mean, even in those days, there was still a certain amount of bureaucracy and things that had to be attended to. And so you'd have to go to a government office and there you'd, you'd be sitting opposite a, a man from Holland who could, couldn't hardly speak English. And you're trying and you certainly can't speak Dutch and you're trying to resolve what might be an important matter to you. And it's, uh, you know, it wasn't easily uh, d dealt with. And then you have, uh, you know, Kruger deciding that, well, look, you people are working here, yeah? so you are responsible to some extent for the security of the land. You can't expect my Bursians to go and fight the blacks on the borders all the time. So we're going to introduce a system of conscription. You have to go and serve on the frontier and make sure that uh, there are no um, hordes of blacks streaming over there to come and attack us. So here a guy has come out maybe from America and he's a highly qualified man and he's got to, you know, do whatever he's got to do. And then he's got to leave that and uh, leave his family, get on on horseback and go off in the, with a commando and go and protect the country. And at the same time, he's got no vo voting rights. He's, he, he cannot complain about anything. In fact, a committee was formed <clears throat> and they approached Kruger and they said to him, Mr. President, we, we want to protest about all these measures and the, and the difficulties that we are facing here in your country. And Kruger's actual reply was, protest? <laughs> he couldn't believe what they were saying to him. How can you protest? You don't have any guns. I've got all the guns. You can't protest. And with that, he dismissed them. Well, that was an unfortunate uh, meeting because... Clearly nothing was going to change unless somebody had guns. It seemed like he would understand that that clearly enough. Ah, oh, they did all kinds of things. I, I, I read that they <clears throat> they waylaid him one day, they surrounded him, the eight landers, they untied the horses from his carriage, they grabbed the carriage, they dragged him through the streets of Pretoria or Johannesburg, wherever it was, they rattled him around shouted and yelled at him the old man just sat there and took it and when they were finished he got out of the carriage and went about his his day's work uh, totally unconcerned so um yeah he was he was like that uh, a man who who viewed the world as um, created by god for god's purposes uh, with the chosen race and everybody else black or white, that was not a Boer, was just part of the landscape, like the mountains and the animals and everything. It was they were, they were just things that God had created, but they had no real special impact upon their nation, or nor did they feel any particular responsibility for them. So there was no uh, idea of um, the Boers as such. 
going into, say, for example, the black parts of their country and trying to evangelize the people. Most certainly, if they had black servants, if a Boer family had black servants in their household, uh, they would be educated in the scriptures and they would have to join the family in prayers because they needed to know what the culture of the, the family was and, uh, and how they should behave. And uh, besides, it, it would be very unbecoming of a Christian family to have uh, pagans living with them under their roof. Now, the Rhodesian whites had a little bit of a different perspective. <clears throat> Certainly, uh, the Queen at that time and now, the head of the church, and, um, and they respected her and respected her church, even though there might be many Rhodesian pioneers who were not um, Church of England. They were not Anglicans, but nonetheless, uh, Victoria is our Queen, and her church is the Church of England. But the, the big revival meetings that had swept through Wales, England, and, and Scotland, and places like that, had left an impact on the, on the British people. And even in the 1890s, uh, some of that was still felt, uh, even down here in, in Rhodesia, uh, amongst the people. I mean, we, we know that there's a very good possibility that um, the Shangoni Patrol, one of the last things that they did, according to one African witness at any rate, who spoke about it afterwards, he said they all stood up and they sang a hymn, took their hats off, stood together, sang a hymn. Religion uh, for the Rhodesian has always been very important. Uh, down to this day, I think we're a bit of a paradox because on the one hand we're quite willing to take up arms and, and blaze away at, at people whom we think are, are a threat to our way of life and yet at the same time we uh, are, are deeply devout. Um, just a month or so ago I was invited along to a book launch, a secular meeting here in Cape Town, a Rhodesian artist who was launching a book. And uh, the guys, the mono, were all standing around outside on the veranda of this particular uh, place and um, drinking and talking and uh, having a good time. And then we were called inside and uh, they walked in with their beers in their hands and sat down. And now we're ready for the meeting to begin and to see what this man has brought to show us. But before that begins, okay, uh, the man who is sort of officiating up at the front, Johannes Vessels, uh, calls upon a real out-and-out -out tough Salute Scout to stand up and to to lead us in prayer. And this man does so. And every one of us, you know, we have our heads bowed out of respect. Now I'm sure amongst a crowd like that, there are folk who, who have varying degrees of, of spirituality. Some may not even believe. But we do have respect. We do have great respect for our Creator, and He's regarded very much as 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 the one who is our great commander. And and you know He is He has laid down His requirements, and uh, and we feel that we we might not live up to them, but at least we we acknowledge that they are necessary and that they are there, and we ought to be doing something about, you know, complying and conforming to what uh, he would like us to be. So here you have the early Rhodesians <coughs> who, um, who do not have the viewpoint that, that Kruger has. They are more evangelical. They lean to that side of Christendom. And they see the black inhabitants there as people who, who really need to be made aware of the fact that the superstition and the darkness that they've been living in for hundreds, if not thousands of years, is something which is, which is holding them back. And so, you know, there is this uh, acceptance, a, a wide acceptance, that uh, we need to teach these people, we need to educate them in, in secular matters, yes, certainly, but they also need to understand 
about the kind of things that uh, formed the foundation of Western civilization since the time of Christ. And that is, you know, the, the Christian viewpoint is something that is important. It is something that is beneficial to you, not just in, your, in a spiritual sense, but in every sense. Um, you will be a, a, a more fulfilled person if you, if you understand the doctrines of the Christian church. Yeah, so there, so there was that. So they don't view the black man as, um, as just part of the landscape. He is someone who must be raised up and brought to, to a particular standard. <clears throat> Look, you know, the world gets a little bit upset if one talks like that these days. And it's regarded as perhaps a little bit insulting. But let me tell you something. That although the blacks may have resisted that kind of thing, and uh, Loban Gula was no help. He was a good man. I won't, I won't deny that. Um, but he was not, he was not a, a man that championed the spread of the gospel. He, he wanted his people to stay in their culture, be true to what they were. And, and many of them found it very difficult, even if they wanted to, to follow the Christian path because of the, the, the cultural pressure that they were subjected to. But now, Although there was that initial resistance from the black man in Rhodesia, today we have a situation, man, I tell you, I put my head on a block, <clears throat> where the average Zimbabwean black probably knows a lot more of the scriptures than the average uh, Briton does. I mean, I, I see it. I sit and, I sit and watch quiz programs on, on my television set at times, and now and then it'd be a biblical question, you know, <clears throat> who was the first man in the Bible? And you just get a blank stare from the contestants. And uh, one of them will say, Revelations. You know, just something that sounds religious comes to mind. And I look at that. You, you, you can't ask questions like that in Zimbabwe and get a blank look. In fact, the, the, to I'm, the time is coming and I'm quite happy to to predict this, the time will come when the black man of Rhodesia will be going and taking the gospel to the white man in England. What happened in the past where the, the British brought the gospel to, to Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe will take it back to them. I can see that coming. So, yeah. Um, it, it is. The nation has, uh, has discovered that there is a, there's a great spiritual depth and wealth to Christianity. And they have embraced it and they have clung on to it. And it's just a pity that those early missionaries who labored uh, with so much difficulty in that land uh, are not alive to see the results and the fruits of their labors. So, yeah, i got to start wrapping this up now. <clears throat> Here we've got the blacks knowing that the ancestors are unhappy. Yeah, in South Africa, we've got the Eightlanders who are going through very difficult times, who have been almost told by their president, unless you take up arms in open rebellion, nothing's going to change here. And here you've got the Rhodesians who are naive and uh, who believe good of everybody. There's ferment going on in their own land. The blacks are agitating. They are meeting at night. They are talking about this. They are unhappy about the presence of the whites. And none of this is, is, is being accepted by the, the company and by the settlers. I think it's only Mr. Usher, the only one. I think he, married, he was married to a Matabili girl who knew what was going on and who was warning and saying, there's danger coming. There are storm clouds on the horizon. There's going to be rebellion. I'm, I'm scared of this. I'm telling you, you people better wake up to this. And he was told by the British South Africa company, listen, mate, zip your beak. 
if you keep on talking like this, we're going to throw you in jail because you are you are, you know, peddling alarm and despondency, and we don't need that kind of thing yet. Now, why did we do that? Because you know, why should the Africans be upset? I mean, <clears throat> there's nothing we can do about locusts. We can't do anything about the drought. I mean, these are just natural disasters. And the Runda pest, we did the best that we could to try and eradicate that. So, I mean, why on earth would these people even be contemplating uh, rebellion? Uh, I mean, uh, clearly, you know, we are not the cause of it. Um, so, uh, we, we'll just look the other way. That's, that's nonsense. We don't, we're not prepared for that. And then, of course, from our point of view, we've, we've got the poor Aetlanders down there in South Africa, and we feel for them, you know. Yeah, it would be very nice if, uh, <clears throat> if uh, we had uh, those gold resources that we could use some of that to, to develop our country. But, um, you know, that's not going to happen. If it, if it did happen, it would be by overthrowing the Boer government. And, um, well, uh, we can't deny the advantages that there would be in that for us. But more importantly, it, you know, the, the advantage would be with the Aetlanders, people that could be free and, um, you know, could make a contribution to the country. Some of them have been there for many years that they loved as much as the Boers did. And then you had Rhodes brooding and thinking and troubled. And he could see that there was going to be an uprising in South Africa from the foreigners there in Johannesburg. And uh, what bothered him most, strangely enough, was the possibility, small as it was, nevertheless, in his mind, it was, it was there, was the possibility of an overthrow of the Boer government and that being replaced by an American republic. You know, if it was just a question of the British taking over, you know, that would be fine. It would, you know, he, he could live with that very, very happily. But the fact that the, there was a possibility that the Americans could uh, latch onto the country, well, that would, that would really prove disastrous for all his plans, he thought. And so something had to be done. Uh, something had to be done about the situation there. And uh, the only force available that could possibly have a hope uh, about influencing change there was the British South Africa police. And when Jameson mobilized them and started getting them ready for an invasion of the Transvaal, the Malimo took note. I'm going to stop right there. Uh, folks, thank you very much for your patience. I hope that you haven't been thinking that I've labored this question of religion too much. I haven't. It's just that, you know, these, these were things that took place in those days and they, they certainly influenced matters. So um, on that note, let me just thank you again for your interest, for, for watching. Uh, to all of those of you who have contributed to the channel, oh, you know, <clears throat> I'm greatly indebted to you. I, I did make a couple of little movies, especially for you, where I, I told you what was going on in my life and so on. Well, I've, um, I've resigned from, from my regular full-time job now, and um, from next month, I will be, um, you know, self-employed, and um, hopefully I will have more time to produce more movies. And um, I am just ever so grateful for folk who have, uh, who have really made this possible for me. So thank you all. Um, and I just uh, trust that you'll all have a good weekend and that you'll keep safe. And uh, God bless you all. Bye for now. Cheers.